I'll try not to go on for too long because I come from a family of talkers. Uh, but basically, um, I'll flick through, first of all, to the international perspective. They had the World Congress of Soil Science here in Brisbane, as you probably know, in the year 2010. And two of the greatest concerns were the depleting fresh water resources around the world and the depleting um, good agricultural land. And there were two very impressive speakers. One was Colin Charters, who wrote here this book about how we're likely to be running out of water if we're not very careful. And the second one was The Coming Famine by Julian Cribb. So I'll recommend these two as, as which express the international concern about our situation. And then I'll come back to DPI. In 1981, they, I'll come over here, Mr. S uh, ph photographer. Um, they, they took the best expertise. This was at the time when they had extension officers throughout the state. And they combined all the information they could to work out which parts of Queensland had the best um, crop potential, had the best um, pasture potential, and which would be the more marginal areas. And just looking at the dominant land suitability for crops and for pastures, here from here you'll see the, the, the greatest variety of colours for um, is in our part of the world down here. So you have Brisbane and then Toowoomba, Darling Downs and beyond. So that, that's much of the concentrated area at the table and elsewhere. There are other maps here. Then the crop potential, the variety of crops that can be grown, summer crops and winter crops and horticultural crops. Again, on this map you might like to study that basically the greatest variety of colours is in our part of the world down here. And um, for me, the tragedy is that at that stage, in 1981, they didn't say, well, we should put um, a circle around these key areas for ag pasture production, for agricultural production, for future generations, and then be able to say to the mining and other companies, look, the other areas are marginal. Um, feel free to work in those areas. But that, unfortunately, wasn't the case. So this just gives you an idea, this is Cecil Plains, to give you an idea of the potential. They've just had a crop of um, sorghum, there's the stubble. With their precision planting these days, they can plant right into that same line with the chickpeas. And over in the distance, you'll see the, the, the cotton modules. So that's an example of winter cropping, summer cropping, and other crops that you can grow in that part of the world. On um, laser leveled land with very expensive equipment, but very efficient. So what's so special about our cropping soils? And I'll mention the rainfall, the water supply first of all, rainfall and irrigation, and particularly groundwater supplies. And I'll talk about, I'm going to talk about the golden crust. And that's probably the top foot or even the top six inches of soil, or the top 15 centimetres, which is most productive. And then the water holding capacity of the soils and then, of course, in the tops layer, this golden crust, this is where we have most of the biological activity as well. So this gives you one example of one, one of the Waco soils. It's about um, a meter, a profile of 1.6 meters. And the beauty of this soil is the classic cracking clay soil of the Darling Downs. And it holds a water holding capacity of about 250 millimeters. Now, many soils are only down to about 50 or 100 millimeters. So this means these soils will hold enough moisture almost to see a crop through from planting almost through to maturity, especially with crops like wheat. Another example is a, uh, this type of soil near Capone. And again, um, you'll see it's this broad acre farming. Again, high water holding capacity, but with a problem further down the profile I'll mention in a minute to do with sodium. So this, again, emphasises this golden crust. You'll find that most of your phosphorus is close to the surface. So here you're going down to the depth from 0 to 10, down to 20 to 40 centimetres. So this available phosphorus, or extractable phosphorus, is highest in that topsoil. And this is why we need to try and look after that very carefully. A similar story for carbon. Mostly, that's down to various depths, mostly concentrated in the top 10 to 20 centimetres. So if the subsoil becomes the topsoil, that becomes buried, 
and this subsoil, which is far less productive, becomes the less fertile land where you probably can't grow crops as easily. Will you come out and talk to the gas companies about that? <laughs> <laughs> because they seem to think that all, all, it's like oil vein oil and soil vein soil. It's all the same. Don't get me going on this one. <laughs> so I've been involved with government agencies and submissions as well. So, so we don't get sidetracked. Uh, this was this capone soil where at 50 to 60 centimetres you have this big increase in sodium. Now, the exchangeable sodium is the sodium in proportion to the total sodium, potassium, calcium and magnesium. And the general figure that he used to use was if this figure is greater than 6, you might have a problem with your soil structure. And that's still like the figure that's used today. So if this subsoil becomes the topsoil, as we saw in Joe Hill's case, you have all sorts of problems. So what are our alternatives? We can consider the cropping or the mining, and then once you have the soil disturbance, if you can keep those top layers intact, and they're trying to do this at Ackland, I've given full marks for trying to do this, um, you'll try and believe you'll try and retain the fertility close to the surface, but otherwise you'll simply bury some of that rich fertile soil. Then there's another problem with heavy machinery. Once it goes across black cracking clay soils, it almost forms a solid road because it compacts so much. <coughs> there's a question then about whether or not that soil can ever um, be restored to agricultural production later on. And also, of course, you've then created a waterway, a washway with compaction with heavy machinery, and then what, leg what legacy are we leaving for the future? So here we are, this is um, Helton that you may hear more about. This is where they plan to build the um, coal, have the coal mine at, with Amber Energy. That's, and you'll hear much more from one of our speakers, Rob McCreth, later on, about the variety of crops they can grow there, the close settlement, the community. That's the alternative. And this is actually um, Ackland Coal Mine, which I took photographed on the official tour. Now, although they're trying to reclaim that as they move from section to section, we'll, you're about to end up finally with a big hole. And there's the question of the quality of water in here, yes? There won't be a hole, there'll be a void, we were told. A, a void, a void. No, that's a new word for a hole is a void. <laughs> we're learning something every day, void. So that's the alternative. And that, this is the um, an aerial view of the Ackland coal mine. The, the, the background and so on, so on looks, actually looks white in there. But you can see how, how much agricultural production was around there originally. The world still needs coal, though. And now this is what, the ultimate of what can happen. This is the legacy in the Hunter Valley. Mm -hmm. and, and each of those white areas, again, is one of the coal mines. That, and they, they really do pay for all that, they told us. Uh, well, uh, anyway, this, this is the alternative. <laughs> So coal seam gas, I'll say a little bit about how coal seam gas actually works. Some background to it, its influence on farming operations. Then with these broad acre um, cropping areas, they've had laser leveled land. And if you're going to get lots of traffic coming in out from roads to the wellheads, they create all sorts of problems. And then there's the question of access and erosion. I'll actually read this because it, it took me some time to actually get my hand or head around this one, then how deep the gas wells can be from 200 metres to one, what's, um, seven um, um, kilometres. The spacing of these wells is between 750 metres to a, a kilometre. It's under that now. It's down to about 350. Down to 350? Yeah. And they're planning four to 400 to 500 new wells each year. So then you have the gas treatment plants, which receive the gas from all these these wellheads, 18 to 20 kilometres apart. Then you've got the problems of the ponds associated with those for the holding the water. And then they talk about treating the water by reverse osmosis. That's fine. It's as though you're filtering the water to remove most of the ions. Then, of course, the, the water's so pure they have to add more you know, gypsum to it at least. But there's still the question of what happens to all the salt concentrate that's being ponded. And then you'll see the grid network in a minute. So, continuing on, um, you, you may all know this, but took the, actually the, the coal, the gas itself is under pressure 
um, with the water in the coal seams. And it's not until the water pressure is released that then the gas is released from the coal meshes and it comes up to the surface to be separated with the gas going to the processing plant and the water to the treatment plant. And that can be anywhere between 200 to 1,000 metres into the ground. It's all rather interesting there. Continuing on, so that's um, a, a typical wellhead, and here you can see that first of all we've got the compressed ground around the wellhead, and then already there's a little bit of a gully formation here, and that they're, may well. They've improved that now. They've got a they've got a blue metal drain there now. <laughs> well, righto. Yeah. There's no water supposed to, if there is, there's no water supposed to run off that area. Oh, I don't know. Well, we'll see what happens with the next flood. <laughs> Continue. So then you have the comp compressed compression of the soil. So that's um, another problem. Then if you're the farmer with your broad acre farming, how on earth do you manage to farm with all those signs in place? Can you can see. <laughs> so there's your broad acre crop uh, again at Cecil Plains. Um, laser level land and so on. And you can also grow beautiful wheat crops. You can also grow beautiful um, chickpea crops and beautiful cotton crops. And put in, but this is what one of the networks looks like. Now, if you can imagine that network of access roads, because they have to service these wellheads, superimposed on that broad acre farming, um, how many problems that may well create? And then the, the problems of water running off down the laneways as well. Then you've uh, upset the levels of the land as well. And Joe can tell us about more of those problems. Then now they're, they're talking about building in between those, they're going to drill down into the show. Okay. There's going to be another lot of wells going in there. And power lines, a power line to every wellhead. And then also there's a problem of moving stock. Yeah. And, and then vehicles coming in and out. With gates. They, don't tell you, they don't tell us that at the beginning. So that gives you the idea of, of again, of the way they normally have the, the control traffic and the problems that can create. So the coal seam gas, the or, or first question is of water reserves. Now, initially, when they drill the wellhead, you mostly get the water coming out. Um, and then as that decreases, so more and more gas comes out. So now, this is a particular point here, if you look at that condomine alluvium, the question is if you're going to be removing water from that black layer called the Walloons, then what's the chance of the freshwater aquifers in that pink condomine alluvium draining down into those coal measures and the farmers lose their best water supply? And this question of connectivity is really not understood. Well, and at the moment, next door to me, the next door neighbour's bore has dropped 60 metres. Hmm. Already. It's happening already, yeah. yeah. And then the, this, this next diagram again is for, uh, full marks to Santos for this. <laughs> so it, it showed the problem that they start to extract the water from here, and then they're showing how you may well get seepage and, and down into that area to replace the water. But then what happens to the farmer's fresh water supplies? Then what I wanted to emphasize on this one is that they have a holding. Um, ponds for the brine or the salt water concentrate and I've yet to meet anybody who can tell us what we're going to do with that salt. Mm -hmm. There's the pipeline, we've seen that before. Now the estimate of how much extra salt may come out of this with this coal seam gas water is on here. You'll see the rainfall is the, the blue, the conventional groundwater, this is the normal situation. The lowest estimate is that orange area or potential estimate is 1.6 um, tons per year of salt, and then what do you do with it? So the risks here, this is what happens with the dispersing soil. The one on the left um, is actually, um, you have added a little, little, little bit of sodium fluoride to the water, so that whole soil structure um, is destroyed. So you form that very fine layer on the bottom, that's impervious, it becomes like a, a, a mush when it's wet, and, and okay. it forms a thick crust, so this, and whereas the one on the right is the same soil, has retained its structure, it will retain its pores and it's still a good agricultural soil. So that's, and that's one extreme case of what can happen to a landscape where there's too much sodium, this is a naturally occurring 
situation, and you can see the slumping and how that land is. That's what can happen. And this is a project I was involved with, with the salt in this paddock. It took us about 10 years to try and overcome that problem. We did, and that's just part of a paddock that was being lost. And so where are the exploration permits at the moment? Coal mining, right across the state, and particularly on our good agricultural land areas, Toowoomba and beyond, but right across the state. And where are the exploration permits for petroleum or coal seam gas? Again, right across the state. Now, if only they'd taken notice of those first maps I showed you in 1981, it would have been a totally different situation altogether. So, to summarising, the impacts of mining and coal seam gas on water and soil could be very alarming indeed. They may not have to be, but they may be. And again, retaining our soil and water resources is crucial for our future food supplies, as mentioned in these two books. And so there's even more importance, I think, for our bridging the divide between the urban and the rural communities, because often in the cities, I think people are almost totally unaware of what the situation is. I'll be very pleased to answer more questions later on. And thank you.